Good morning and welcome to church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sunday, church. Good morning. Good morning, church. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. And it's time to worship. Good morning and welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Good morning and welcome to worship. And welcome to worship. Good morning and welcome to worship. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to worship. And welcome to worship. Good morning and welcome to church. Welcome to church. Welcome to worship. Welcome. Good morning and welcome to church. We love you all so much. Yeet. Yeet.
Good morning and welcome to Oceanside First Presbyterian Church's online worship service. I wanted to let you know that you are incredibly important to our community. So whether you stopped by by happenstance or you've been worshiping with us for a long time, you are an incredibly important part of our community and we are glad that you're here today. There's a couple of things I want to let you know about. First off, I want to make sure that you sign that connection card. It's in your comment window. You can fill that out. And if you have any prayer requests or praises, our prayer ministry will pray for that during the week. I also want to let you know about an opportunity that we are having this week, Monday and Wednesday evening. As you may know, we are in the midst of a very contentious election. And so we are having a prayer gathering, a prayer gathering where we are praying for our nation, a nonpartisan prayer gathering where we are praying for God's will. Those gatherings will be at 6 p.m. on Monday night and on 6 p.m. on Wednesday night. We invite all of you to come and there's more information on the church's website about that. Also, in November, the third weekend of November, we are going to have a praise night. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be out on our front lawn, and there's going to be some incredible music taking place. And so we invite you to check out the website because there'll be more information on dates and specifics and times and things like that. But it's a great opportunity to come together and to hear some wonderful music. Well, it's time to praise and worship God. Let's do that now together. Good morning, church. It is good to be with you this morning. Let's sing together. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near And I will fear no evil For my God is with me And if my God is with me Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear?
you never let go Lord, you never let go of me Welcome back to the story. Welcome back to our series called Plot Twist. I never saw it coming. I'm so thankful that you've been joining us on this journey as we travel and explore Joseph's life and how God was at work in Joseph's life through the many plot twists that occur in his story. I told you two weeks ago what it took for God to bring me back here to Oceanside First Presbyterian Church. And it was an incredible plot twist in my life that ended me back up at the place that I served as youth director and as an intern to get me to land back here. It just blows me away even to this moment to think how God was at work over the long story and not over the short story to to work his ends, to work his will out. But what I didn't tell you was my personal story, the story behind all of those things. You see, when I grew up, I grew up in a pretty rough and dysfunctional home. Uh, Domestic violence was a regular part of my life. I saw it and I experienced it as a kid. Um, The police were at our home more often than they should. It was almost like a weekly occurrence. Often those police interactions went very poorly. Someone went to jail. There was very, very little stability in my home. There was very, very little emotional security in my home. Uh, dysfunction was the, 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 the meal du jour every day when you would come to my house. And, 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 I, and I tell you right now that I often wondered as a kid, where was God in the middle of this? How could there be a God that was all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving, and and allow a kid like me to go through the situations that I was going through? How, How could there be a God that would allow all these things to happen and never say a word? Why was God so silent in what seemed to be the tragic story of my life? Why does God seem so silent? You see, I think we all have these seasons in our lives where we have a moment where we're crying out to God, where we're reaching out with every fiber of our being so that God might show up, so that God might redeem, so that God might repair or restore or fix the thing that has gone wrong in our life. And, and what, we, what do we hear? We hear nothing. We get no answer from God. We, we get zippo, nada, bada nothing, Zero plus zero equals zero. We get a giant goose egg. We get nothing. We get a, hello, is this still working? We get nothing. And some of us may even get that feeling as we look at this upcoming election that's just happening this next week. We're asking, where is God in the middle of all of these things? But but I want to let you know that Scripture is full of stories where it seems as if God is silent, but God is still at work. You see, there are many times in the, in the stories that God may seem silent, but I will tell you right now that God is still at work. And as we look at Joseph's story, the rest of Joseph's story in just a moment, we're going to see how God may seem silent, but he was always still at work in Joseph's life. So hold on, and I'll be right back to tell you more about it. Never 
today, we're going to have a time of confession. Because each and every one of us come before God knowing that we make mistakes, that we're not perfect, we don't always love and care for people in the way God would want us to. And so we come before God this morning seeking forgiveness. Forgiveness from God. Forgiveness from the people that we've wronged. Forgiveness in our hearts for those things that we feel cannot be repaired. Because we know that when we come before God, that God repairs everything. That God washes us clean, as white as snow. So would you join me in prayer? Loving God, we confess that we have failed to live in harmony with our sisters and brothers. We have been self-righteous in our attitudes, close-minded in our beliefs, and judgmental in our opinions. We have shunned those whose ways we do not understand, and we have despised those who do not understand our convictions. Forgive our discord and conceit, and heal our divisiveness and quarreling. Help us to be charitable in our regard for others, that we may dwell in peace with Christ, who is Lord of all and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
as we dive into the remaining chapters of Joseph's life, I want to remind you that God had and has a purpose for the suffering that Joseph went through and the silence that Joseph went through. He, he didn't just leave him hanging. There is a purpose for all of the things that Joseph is going through, even if Joseph hasn't seen it yet. I want you to hear that again, that there is a purpose for God's silence and there's a purpose for even the suffering that Joseph goes through, even if he hasn't seen it yet. You see, God, you see, God may be silent, but he is certainly not still in this story. Genesis 39 says over and over again that God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph over and over and over again. But you never hear God speaking to Joseph. God's silent in the story, but he is still in the story. So let me catch you up on all the things that are going on in Joseph's story since last we chatted. So last week, Liz finished off the story as, as Joseph interpreted the dream of the cupbearer and the bread baker. And um, he eventually became the uh, right-hand man of Pharaoh. In the meantime, he, Pharaoh had a dream that he interpreted and that dream told Pharaoh and told, told everyone that there was going to be plenty in the land for seven years. It's going to be overflowing with abundance. And then the following seven years, it's going to be absolutely dismal famine and destruction. And so with that interpretation, Pharaoh said, God is with this young man. And Pharaoh put Joseph in charge. Pharaoh put Joseph and made him his right hand man. Pharaoh made Joseph have all the power, power of the king, even though he was just the right-hand man of the king. And so the seven years of flourishing happen. It's great. Joseph is wise, and they begin to store up supplies and grain for the time of, of hunger. The hungry season was coming. And then when the famine hits at the end of the first year, lo and behold, surprise of all surprises, Joseph's brothers show up in Egypt seeking to buy grain from the grain reserves that Joseph had smartly saved. And so when they show up to buy those reserves, Joseph recognizes them. He knows exactly who they are, but they don't know who he is because he's totally changed. He's now a full-grown man, and he's taken on an Egyptian name. He has all the looks of, an, of Egyptian royalty, of Egyptian power. He sits on the throne, and his brothers, much like the dream that he had, kneel before him. And Joseph sends them away, but he sets them up. He sends them away uh, with, with the money back in their bags. He sends them away so that they're going to get in trouble. He sends them away and he says, you're going to come back. And when you come back, you're going to bring me your youngest brother, Benjamin, the one that you told me about. And as collateral, he holds one of the brothers back, uh, Simeon, I believe it is, as, uh, as a prisoner. I mean, this is a, it's a fairly dark, dark tale. It's like Joseph is going kind of sopranos on his brothers. He's setting them up. But God is still at work, even though we don't hear God speaking in this story. We're going to pick up in Genesis 45, 45. It says this. Let me give you a little more context. So the brothers have come back a second time. They brought Benjamin with them. They, they've come into the, to the storeroom. And, and Joseph has met them and met their requests. And then Joseph can't contain it anymore. Starting at verse um, 45. I mean, starting at chapter 45, it says this. Then Joseph could no longer control himself. Before all his attendants, he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence right now! So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph has brought his brothers into a private chamber, has removed all of the guards, and he begins to cry and to weep. Not, not that little one singular man tear. This is the blubbering tears that we've talked about, the uncontrollable tears, the, the <laughs> kind of tears that just that you can't stop. This is one of those moments where it's a clear, clear emotional outburst. 
And Joseph says to his brothers, verse 3, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? The first concern that Joseph has is about his dad. The father that loved him, the father that gave him the coat, the father that he knew must be in distress and despair knowing that one of his sons, believing that one of his sons had died when that wasn't the truth. And so he asked his brother, is my father still alive? But his brothers weren't able to answer him because they were terrified. I mean, this is a plot twist. Wouldn't you be afraid too if you had just sold your brother off to slavery some 20 years ago and now he's the most powerful person in the whole known world and you are kneeling before him? He's just cast out all of the guards. He's acting a little bit crazy. He's, he, he's, he's crying uncontrollably. What's going to happen next is what I think the brothers are asking. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, He said, I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt. I'm not sure that's a moment that that the brothers were sure of what was going to happen next. I'm not sure that's a moment when they hear him say those things. Is, Is he just reading out their indictment? Is he just reading out the charges that are against him? But he follows it up with these words. He says, And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourself for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. It was because that God sent me ahead of you. You see, Joseph saw today in this moment that God was still at work even in the silence. Joseph was choosing forgiveness over judgment. He was choosing restoration over resentment. He was choosing love over leveling the scales. A little brother doesn't normally do that unless they grow up a whole bunch. For two years now, there had been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there was going to be still no plowing and no reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you that sent me here, but God. Do you, do you hear Joseph understanding the, the big story now? Do you hear Joseph removing the blame from his brothers? Do you see Joseph stepping into the role that God asked him, that showed him, that led him into? As I said earlier, we're always looking for Jesus' footprints in this story. And Joseph in this story is definitely a savior-type figure, as in this role he's going to save thousands of people's lives. Verse 8. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father or advisor to Pharaoh, uh, lord of his entire household and ruler over all of Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all of Egypt. Come, Come down to me and don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children, and your grandchildren, your flock, and your herds, and all you have, and I will provide for you there, because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. He is inviting the family to the place where there is life. He's inviting the family to leave the land of desolation and come to a place where he can be cared for and will later become one of the most fertile valleys of all time. And in verse 12, Joseph makes it clear who he is. He says this, You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it really is I who am speaking to you. Tell my father all about the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. Again, an emotional outpouring. And Benjamin embraced him and and, and weeping. And he kissed all of his brothers and wept over them. And afterwards, his brothers uh, spoke with him. It was 20 years ago that he was sold into slavery. 
He was 19 years old when this happened. He's 39 years old when he finds restoration. 20 years led Judah, one of his brothers, to, to grow from throwing his brother into the pit to, in earlier chapters, deciding he's willing to offer himself as a sacrifice. His brothers grew during that time of suffering. His brothers grew up and became men of faith and character during that time of separation. You see, God may be silent, but God certainly is not still. If you look at Genesis chapter 50, as we conclude Joseph's story, you hear this line. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Let me say that again. As for you, you meant you may have meant this for evil against me, but God meant it for good. I'll be right back to conclude our plot twist with Joseph. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, Alleluia, Alleluia. The burning sun with golden beam, the silver moon with softer gleam, favorite hymns is Amazing Grace. And what gets me choked up a little bit every time we sing it is that last verse. And I love that last verse because it says this, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing god's praise than when we first began And the reason why I love that verse is that I imagine all of the communion of saints, those who have gone before us, our family, our friends, those who we sat with year after year in church, those who taught us of our faith, gathered around our Lord and singing praises, praising God year 
after year. Today is All Saints Day. It's a day when we celebrate those who have gone before us in faith and are living that faith out in heaven. And we celebrate those who are here, who are the communion of saints. And it's this holy mystery that I don't fully understand. But I'm just so grateful for those who went ahead of me in faith and who were persecuted, who stood up for their faith so that I could freely worship God. And I believe that when we give offering, especially on this All Saints Day, that we are doing what our ancestors of faith did before. We are giving so that others in the future might know the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Christ Jesus, we are ever thankful for those who have gone before us in faith. We are thankful for the communion of saints gathered around us, both in heaven and on earth, who celebrate you in their lives, by how they give of their time and their talent and their treasures. And God, we pray that we would learn from them and we would step forward in faith giving to the call to reach, teach, and serve our community in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know You 
have every failure, God. You have every victory. You know, in all of this story, God was silent. There's not a moment where you hear it say, and God said to Joseph, or the Lord spoke to Joseph. God never speaks to Joseph in this story. God spoke to his dad. God spoke to his grandfather. God even spoke to his great-grandfather. But God says nothing at all to Joseph. Without Joseph in this story, without Joseph having the amazing plot twist that we had in this story, our story would have come to an end with Jacob and the, bro- uh, Jacob and the brothers out in the, at, out in the wilderness. But because Joseph was sent away, he provides the way, he provides the pathway, he provides the avenue in which the brothers and the family and the promise of God are going to be sustained If Joseph wasn't sold into slavery, if Joseph didn't move through the ranks, if Joseph didn't become Pharaoh's right-hand man, the family and the promise of God would have died. But that was not God's plan. You see, God may be silent in this story, but he is not still. God may seem silent in the face of all of Joseph's sufferings and trials, but he is certainly not still. Now, I, I think it's easy for us to imagine Joseph's situation because, well, that's the story we're given. We're, we're told Joseph's story all throughout the narration because it's told through his eyes. But as a dad, I wonder about Jacob. It's easy to see this story through Joseph's eyes, but when you think about Jacob's eyes, about a father that has lost his beloved son, about about a father who's trusted God all the way and now God is silent and it seems as if his story is going to come to an end. We hear no mentioning of, of God speaking to Jacob. We hear no mentioning of the Lord spoke to Jacob again. In fact, we hear from the brothers that, that, that his dad is destroyed by the idea that the, he may lose his other son, Benjamin. Joseph's first question was, is my dad alive? This is a story of a father and a son's love for one another. It's, it's a desperate son crying out for his father, and it's a desperate father being reconnected to his son. Is my father still alive? Now, church, I want you to get this. Joseph is more than just a story of incredible forgiveness, but let me hear this. I want you to hear this. Forgiveness is definitely still there. It is an incredible story of forgiveness. It's more than just a story of family reunification, but there's that too. There's a, an amazing reunification story that's told in this passage. This is even more than a story of God working his will out the long way around, although God is working his will out the long way around over 20, 30 years. This is a story of plot twists that we never saw coming, but God had written all along. Hear that again. This is a story of plot twists that we could never anticipate coming, but God knew all along. There was purpose to the suffering. There was a plan in the silence. 
And God is speaking into your life, even if you can't hear it. God is speaking purpose into your struggles, even if you have not seen it yet. Joseph's story is a story of God speaking, even when Joseph can't hear it. Because even though it seems that God is silent, he is certainly not still. It's a story of redemption for those who don't even know that they needed redemption. It's a story of growth and development, of hope and of promise and, and, of, and of God's power to work through circumstances, and to create plot twists that change everything. Church, God may seem silent in your life today, but I want you to hear this, and I want you to trust that he is certainly not still. We need to believe this now more than ever. We need to hold on to God now to know that God is still in charge during this time of famine, during this time of plague, during this time of uncertainty, during this time of whatever is going on in your family, that God is still God, during good times or bad times, during struggles and painful moments, God is still there. God is still there. And so I want to invite you today, I want to invite you as you recognize that even in the silence that God is still there, that God is still moving, that God is not still, I want to invite you to hold on. I want to invite you to, to trust more. I want to invite you to recognize that God is still at work in the silence. He's closer than you think he could ever be. He, he, you may not see him, but he is absolutely at work in your life. He is certainly not still. And as we come to this table, we recognize God's grace and God's gift poured out to us through his son. We recognize uh, the power of the empty cross and the full table. We, we, we recognize that, that in the silence that God offers us a brand new hope. And so I invite you to take your elements today, the bread and the cup, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, to, to par partake of them knowing that this is Christ's body broken for you, knowing that this is Christ's blood shed for you. Uh, experience in them a, a, as moments of redemption, as the sweet taste of hope in your hearts and in your lives. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Would you pray with me? Precious and powerful God, we ask that we would trust that you are still there in the silence. We ask that, that we could see the footprints of your work in our history that we can see the evidence of you moving and changing our lives. Father, we know that you are there in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our struggle. And you're just asking us to hold on a little bit longer, to trust you a little bit more. Uh, that, that hope is coming. There, there, there's a promise in the dawn. One more minute. One more hour, one more day, one more week, one more year, one more decade. Father, we trust that you are in charge and you are holding all of us together. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Amen.